This is an interview in the oral history series for the Space Archives at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Today, January 31st, 2006, we have with us Ellery May, and I'm Charles Lundquist. Ellery, it's good to have you with us. Today. Thank you. Appreciate you asking me. Uh, to start, for the record, Ellery, will you give us a brief outline of your career, where you're from, where you went to school, and how you got to the space program here in Huntsville? Okay, well, I was born in central Alabama, a little town called Greensboro. After graduation from high school, I entered the U.S. Army Air Force and spent about three and a half years, I guess, in the United States Air Force. After the war was over, World War II, uh, I went to college at, at Auburn University. I think at that time it was called Alabama Polytechnic Institute. Graduated in 1947 with a degree in aeronautical engineering. I then went to the NACA, which was a forerunner of NASA. Worked there for about three years doing aeronautical research in wind tunnels. Which center? Uh, that's the Langley Research Center. And I returned to Alabama in 1951. I uh, went to work for uh, the Army Missile Command <clears throat> in, uh, in July of 1951. And I spent the rest of my career with the same group, although it changed over to NASA in 1960. So that's how I got to the space program. Early on in your work, I think you were involved in wind up. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, my experience at Langley Research Center in Virginia was in uh, high-speed uh, wind tunnel testing of swept wings for the modern airplanes. And so when I came to Redstone, uh, they needed uh, some wind tunnels. And there was an old Athena Monday wind tunnel test section that was given to Redstone. Uh, Naval Ordnance Laboratory, and they were trying to refurbish this to do some, so they could do the testing here in Huntsville, rather than run all over the country. And so I was uh, put in charge of getting that wind tunnel up and running, along with the help of some very dedicated other people. So you know, I spent quite a few years doing wind tunnel testing for the for the Redstone and the Saturn V. That wind tunnel that you mentioned, you said it came from the Naval Ordnance Lab. Was it one of the ones that Rudolf Hermann had worked on in Germany? That's correct. The wind tunnel was originally used in Finland, and after the war it was uh, given to the Naval Ordnance Laboratory along with several others, and they had no need for this particular seven-inch tunnel, so they gave it the rest. And that's how we got into the wind tunnel. In his memoir, Dr. Herman mentions that the U.S. military loaded up over 100 railroad cars with wind tunnel equipment to, to ship out of where he was in Germany, and then most of it went to the Naval Ordnance Lab. That's, so this, that's correct. This is one of the ones that had that, that history and that's right. background. That's the background. So Dr. Herman himself came to you age uh, a little later. Did you have any contact with him? No, I don't think I had any direct contact with him, but I had heard of him. In General Gardenberger's book about the V-2, he makes a great deal of emphasis on how important the wind tunnel work was in getting the V-2 uh, flying. Did you have the same Set of circumstances with the redstone, or what? Well, well, it sort of just uh, fell in line with what you normally do uh, in designing a new aircraft or spacecraft or, or rocket. Uh, you make sure you know the aerodynamic characteristics of it so that you can properly control and guide it to wherever it is you want it to go. So, wind tunnel testing in the data, in order to be able to do that properly. Is why we use wind tunnels for the test. It's a vital part of the development of any uh, rocket. Did you run in any particular surprises, or was it all fairly routine? 
Well, that was pretty pretty routine, really. With the thing we learned on testing of the Saturn V that was a little bit unusual was that the, the boundary layer uh, across the vehicle as it went through the atmosphere was tremendously affected by the plume of the rocks. And it caused the boundary layer to separate almost to the front end of the Saturn V. And that was a little bit of surprise to some of the aerodynamic design people. Other than that, it was pretty routine. How long were you with the wind tunnel work, first the Army and then at NASA? I think, this us see, I started about 1951, and I stayed in the wind tunnel directly until about 1966, so that's around 15, 16 years, and then I moved up to uh, the staff of Dr. Geisler, who was the head of the aerodynamics laboratory, I worked on his staff for a couple of years, and then from there, I went to work in the newly formed system engineering office working for a brilliant engineer named Louis Richard. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's, that's uh, when I really got in, out of the wind tunnel business into the systems type work. It was very interesting. What systems did you work on? Well, it was the, the uh, primarily the, the Saturn launch vehicles. You know, the system engineering office for the Saturn launch vehicles. It was sort of like we were the conductor of the orchestra to make sure that everybody was playing off of the same sheet of music. System engineering is very vital. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so that's how I really got my most of my experience in the, in the Saturn program was in the system engineering class. Later you did a, a tour at NASA headquarters. No, I never went to NASA headquarters. Okay. I don't want to ask the headquarters, but I was, I was spared there. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm misinformed. Now. Okay. You, you ended up, though, working on the Apollo Soyuz program. Yes. Uh, How did that come about? Well, from the system engineering office, we worked on all of the systems that the Saturn was involved in, which is Apollo, uh, Skylab. And eventually, the uh, Apollo Soyuz. And uh, so, my boss in system engineering was uh, Richard Smith. He was head of the Saturn System Engineering Office. And he was promoted to uh, uh, the Saturn Program Manager's Office. And so, I took over as chief of the Saturn System Engineering Office. And then, after. When, when was that? What day about? Uh, that was probably. Around 1973, 74, maybe a little earlier than that, 72. But after the lunar landings were completed, uh, Dick Smith went up to the program manager's office and I took over the system engineering office for Saturn. And then uh, later on, about 1973, uh, Dick Smith went up to uh, deputy center director and I was appointed chief of the Saturn program office that time. And we only had one mission left, and that was to be the Apollo Soviet test project. And that was about 1973 that I, that I was in that position. Did you have lots of interactions with the Russians during that program? I had some, but most of the interface with the Russians was done from Johnson Space Center because they, the rendezvous uh, in space would be with the two spacecraft of course, the spacecraft centers would be the ones logically to coordinate with the Russians on that. I did meet the, the, the cosmonauts on a couple of occasions. And one of those occasions was a fun occasion where they took the cosmonauts for a tour of Disney World. And I uh -huh. and oh, that, that was fun. So that was fun. That was fun. And, uh, but that was my only contact with the Russians. And the rest of it was handled by the Houston. Okay, fine. Well, we appreciate here at UAH you're contributing many materials on the Apollo Soyuz program to our archive. Well, I was happy to do so. You know, it wasn't until after the program was over that uh, someone reminded me that, that we used our last Saturn launch vehicle to launch 
three American astronauts in the space to shake hands with the Russians. Okay. <laughs> That's what we used it for. But it was a forerunner of the International Space Station because that was the beginning of working out uh, system approaches and uh, policies for uh, international cooperation in space. And the end result, of course, is the International Space Station which has now been, I guess, fully manned for about five years. Yes. Uh, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a beginning, and the troops are in the uh, International Space Station. Were you involved in any of the experiments or help uh, promote any of the experiments that were done on the Apollo Soyuz? No, I did not participate in the experiment, but one of the gentlemen that worked for me uh, was heavily involved in coordinating the experiments that came out of the Marshall Center. They were flown on the ASTP in July of 1970. What was that? Uh, his first name was Bob. <laughs> I can't remember his last name. It's been just shocked. It's been 30 years. Okay, all right, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll excuse you on that. <laughs> well, what other tales are there about the Apollo Soyuz program that people might be interested in knowing in the future? Well, I don't know there were any specific tales, uh, although it was certainly in the beginning of cooperation in space by other countries, you know. And I think that was the significance of it. And it proved that, uh, you know, that, that we could do it. And I think the fact that the Russians are part of that uh, International Space Station thing has really uh, been a blessing for NASA since we've had so much problems with the, the shuttles. They, they've kept it going with their supply ships and Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think the careful system engineering contributed to the success of the whole Saturn V program? Well, I don't think there's any question about that. It's like I said before, that being a system engineer is kind of hard to define, but I look at it sort of like the conductor of an orchestra. He didn't write the music, but he knew how to conduct it and make, uh, make, make sense of it. Someone has to make sure that everybody is, all, is, is working off of the same sheet of music, so to speak. I think it's vital that uh, the project have a system engineering group that, that makes sure that that happens. So, and it was a real fun time for me. I really enjoyed it. Come, coming back to the wind tunnels, we had a visitor here to the UH archives. Mm -hmm. German student who was working on a thesis. I believe he talked to you. Yes, I remember. Very nice. Comments on that? Well, you know, I couldn't believe that someone was doing a, a thesis on an advanced degree on wind tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> to me, wind tunnels are pretty basic too. But it was surprising. But he was doing his uh, thesis for his advanced degree on wind tunnels, in particular the history the Dinamundi wind tunnels and what happened to them and how they influenced the wind tunnels in this country. And I, I believe his field was history, not yes. technology. Yeah, probably so, right. So right. doing a history of wind tunnels was unusual. Mm -hmm. And it was unusual the way the wind tunnel equipment from Germany that was involved in the V2 mm -hmm. and other things got picked up a whole big train load of it. Right. Right to the U.S. and then distributed between the various laboratories here. You've got one piece. We've got one piece and it did require some massive uh, alterations. Okay. But we, would, we did that uh, another friend of mine, Oscar Holder, who was a very, a very good mechanical designer. He redesigned that little wind tunnel test section into something that was really, uh, really super. And after we finished using it, we gave it to all the universities. So it's still operating. Oh, it's still operating. It's still operating at all the university. Uh, it's interesting. It has been for several years. Well, that's an interesting turn of events. Right. Wind tunnel has really been around the world, though. It's been around the world. 
It's the best in Alabama. The best in Alabama. Bob, what other things about your career strike you as amusing or interesting that people would like to know about? Well, it was just a really fun time at NASA. You know, we were working on the Apollo program. And there are many stories. I have to think a long time to think of some that perhaps were funny. But I do know that, uh, that uh, the fact that we were able to uh, reach the moon when we did, ahead of the Russians and everybody else, was the fact that an American by the name of George Bell, who was the administrator of NASA at the time, made a historic decision uh, which shocked the German community, particularly here in Huntsville. And that was that he said, you know, this, this idea of uh, firing one stage and let the other stages be dummies and then maybe if that was successful, you do the second stage. It was sort of a, a long approach to development. And Dr. Miller said, well, if the first stage works, let's go ahead and use the second stage. And if that works, use the third stage. So we went all up on the first side. It was completely ready to go. The first Saturn V. First Saturn V from the very beginning. And on the third launch, you know, we actually sent three men around the room on Apollo 8. So I think that, to me, that was a significant decision that Dr. Miller made that enabled the United States to get ahead of the Russians so far that there's no way they could catch up with it. That's an interesting observation. So that the, uh, the Saturn V was we had some problems with the first one and the second one, but they were fixed in time for the next one. And the third Saturn V took the Apollo 8 astronauts around the moon at Christmas time in 1968. So that was one of my, I guess, uh, fondest memories of working on the Saturn. Did you deal with Mr. Miller or Dr. Miller very much at first? Well, not on a personal basis, but he and Ludie Richard, who I worked for in the system engineering office, were very good friends. Uh, they did a lot of talking. And it was Dr. Miller and Ludie that decided in 1968 that uh, I should go down to Cape Henry. So they sent me down there, uh, I guess it was, it must have been early 1969. And, uh, no, it was 68. I'm sorry, it was 68. And uh, sent me to Cape to coordinate with the technical side of the Kennedy Space Center back to Marshall Space Flight Center to resolve any technical problems that might come up at the time. Well, how long were you down there? I was down there about six months. And, uh, I was there for the launch of Saturn 502. Who was your interface at? Well, the interface of the Cape was Dr. Gruny. He was the head of the technical side of the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And they just wanted to cut the loop between <coughs> the technical people there and the technical people of the hospital. And some of the program folks were not too happy about that, but apparently it worked out. Yeah. It obviously worked. It obviously worked. The launches went off without a hitch. Well, that was a decision that Dr. Miller and Blue Richard made about having me go down. Excellent. Now, to wind up, do you have any advice you would like to put on the record to the, the newcomers and the young, young folks that are now trying to go back to the moon? Well, just remember your own team and work it as a team. Talk to each other, make sure everybody's talking. That's the most important uh, suggestion and advice that I can give. You know, that we're all members of a team. The team is the one that's going to make the project successful, and not some hot shot individual. Uh, and good system engineering. Good system engineering, absolutely. Absolutely. Anything more you'd like to no, I think, add? I think that's it, Chuck. Uh, well, we thank you for coming today, and we'll add this tape to the archive and in particular we associated with your Apollo Soyuz material that you donated. Okay. Thank you for that and for coming.
I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much.